Nava Samel, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for hosting me. You're here at United Nations headquarters for an event that highlights the way in which we can use the medium of the arts to convey the universal lessons of the Holocaust. This is something that you've tackled extensively in your work. Your first book, Hat of Glass, was the first Israeli work of fiction dealing with the second generation. Was the Holocaust a subject you always knew you had to write about? No, it chose me and not, uh, not the other way around. Because when I started writing, uh, I didn't even realize that the Holocaust is such a, a profound um, component in my identity. Because the Israeli, the Israeli society during the early 80s uh, had a very s different self-image, a self-image that we are freshly new. We are a new leaf in the page in history. Uh, we don't have to look back. The Holocaust uh, was an, a horrific event in the history of the Jewish people, but we Israelis, we started afresh. We look uh, uh, um, into the future and not into the past. And when I started writing, especially in Head, uh, Head of Glass, I, uh, I realized that all my protagonists are sons and daughters of Holocaust survivors. And in order to really make their way into the future, grow up, um, this, uh, make their own you know, mature decision about marriage, career, being a parent, all those decisions require them to look back going uh, to their parents and ask them the question, uh, what, what happened to you during the Holocaust? Meaning making the Holocaust a private issue and rather than a, you know, a ritual or a calendaric one or a, a more a, a national event. And the characters actually pose the question to their parents before I ever did pose the question to my own mom. And they led the way. So I actually followed my characters and followed my book. And then writing almost, I was almost half through in the book, I came to my mom and, and really dared ask the question because this was a very, very dangerous territory. I always felt that we should uh, embrace our parents and protect them from memory because memory was always dangerous. And what did your mom say? when you presented her with the book? I, rec I vividly recall the expression on her face. It was a relief, as if, oh, at last somebody came to ask, which reminded me of a very famous Chinese saying, we are in the UN, so I can quote <laughs> another culture. <laughs> uh, in order for the truth to come out, we need, there are two conditions which are required. One that there's one who will tell the truth, and the other one, which is, no less important is that there will be someone who will listen to the truth. And I think that in the early 80s in Israel, the two conditions, the, the, there was a window of oppor opportunity on both sides. The parents no longer felt that they have to protect their children from memory because this was like a mutual protection pact. You don't ask and I don't tell. Uh, so the, the parents saw that their kids already grew up. We were parents ourselves. I think that's the most crucial thing was that I became a mother myself. So my mom was ready. She saw the third generation. I think she was ready to talk about her past in a very cautious way. Uh, but she was ready to open up. And I was ready to listen. And I wasn't that threatened by the past and by the fact that I was so afraid to learn uh, about the atrocities done to my own parents. I think this was the most uh, threatening thing for a child of survivors. What advice would you give to aspiring writers or artists who want to address the Holocaust in their works? First of all, be true to yourself and be true to the events. Don't manipulate history. Be very careful to uh, take care of the fact that all the historical facts and events will be accurate. That's how I start every book. First of all, I bow to, my, to the historians, to researchers, to people who collect testimonies, to the true facts. 
then I built my fictional world. The fictional world is always fictional characters who operate and who live in a set, but the set has, will be, must be truthful. Because what I do as an author is I interfere or I, um, or I create the emotional sphere of my characters, but I never touch the true events, the, 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 actual, play, the actual place where they live and operate. And what's it like for you personally to write books about the Holocaust, to write plays about the Holocaust? Is it a grueling experience, not only physically as a writer, having to you know, start at nine and end at five or whatever your routine is, but emotionally, what's it like? How do you cope? Sometimes it's very tough. I don't want to, you know, uh, be a whiny person or a whiny author who tells you, oh, it was so difficult, I paid the price. But let's say that sometimes I feel that I live with, with a very, very alive ghosts. It's an oxymoron, but the ghosts are very alive. Uh, they use me as a corridor. They say, you will be our corridor. You will voice our thoughts, our feelings. I feel that I owe them. Sometimes it's, it's uh, energy consuming, sometimes uh, I lose the borderline between my fictional characters and myself. In, in the Red Laughed, uh, the main character is a, is a, is a survivor who was a, as a five years old, she was hidden by Polish peasants in a small village and she was abused and molested by them and she lost her identity and she was on the verge of starvation. The only thing that saved her sanity uh, was a companion that she had in the pit, in the potato pit where she was hidden, and that was a rat. And when I wrote the events in the pit, uh, when the little girl starved, I stopped eating. When she didn't sleep, I stopped sleeping. It's uh, my mind, of course, knew that I'm not losing it. That that this is these are fictional. It's a fictional character, but my body refused. My body was totally into it. So I do lose sometimes the borderline. Uh, but that's if it's a price, then that's a price that I'm ready to pay in order for my characters to be, uh, to full extent, what they should be. To, to, I need to get the full resolution of their emotional scale, emotional sphere. In order to do that, sometimes if that's a sacrifice that I make, then, then I'm, I'm willingly doing it and actually happily, as long as these uh, ghosts, alive uh, ghosts, are satisfied with the work that I'm doing as their spokesperson or their corridor. Why do you think that it's important that the UN encourages Holocaust education and remembrance? Because the UN is a very prestigious stage of all nations and it should, the, the Holocaust education, Holocaust awareness should come out of the UN because there are already voices in the world that deny the Holocaust. One is a member of the UN, the Iran government. The, it's a state, among, a nation among the na nations, very respectable one. And some of the people in Iran deny it and they deny the Holocaust when the Holocaust survivors are still among us. So that worries me because what will ever happen uh, when they are no longer among us? The extent of denial could, could be much worse. Uh, when I came to the UN and I saw all the flags, the flags represent something. They rep represent nations who aspire for freedom, who aspire for democracy, who aspire for human rights. These aspirations are 
are a, are f are general to us all, to every nation. It doesn't divide us. On the contrary, it's it's something that links us, and it links us in a way that we should voice one voice because the Holocaust was something unprecedented in the human history. Human beings did these atrocities to other human beings. That's the message that should come uh, from a body like the UN, which deals with human beings all over the world. It should, write, it should put the writing on the wall all the time. Look what happened in the 20th century. In the enlightened world, that's what humans did to other humans. And we should be careful and responsible that such a thing will never, will never happen again. And what does it mean for you personally to take part in this event? You've come a very long way. Well, I'm very emotional about it. <laughs> I didn't eat for two days. <laughs> <laughs> I'm emotional because my mom is, is still with me and she called me this morning. I already talk, spoke with her twice. She's almost 93 years old. Uh, her mind is like a razor blade. And she sent me with what we call in Hebrew, tefillat haderech. That's the prayer of the way. It's very important when somebody, a Jew, goes on a journey, an important journey, he prays a special prayer to be, not only to be protected, but, but that's something that his beloved ones send him away with their love, with their caring. And I feel the spirit of my mom with me all the time. Can you tell me a little bit about your mom? Is she a Holocaust survivor? Yes. Tell my me about mom, her. My mom's name, she's Mimi Arzi. She was born in a, a part which is now Romania. Um, she was deported. She lived in Hungary during the war. She was deported to Auschwitz. And from Auschwitz, she was deported to another camp in East Germany, where she was liberated by the Russian Red Army on May 8, 1945. Parts of her story were incorporated into the book Head of Glass, but she became a very, very important source of inspiration for me because of her ability to survive her a philosophy of hanging on to life at all costs. Uh, the, she always finds the meaning of life. She's not a joyful wom woman because I think that not very many of survivors are very, they have what the French calls joie de vivre, but they have a passion, a strong passion for life. And they chose life over death. They didn't let themselves sink into, you know, the negative and the atrocities and the scars. They could easily sink into that. And they chose to, they heal, to heal themselves, to amend themselves, to start new families. I think this takes an incredible, uh, incredible amount of inner resources. And I salute all the survivors, and I salute my own beloved survivor, who is my mom. And do you think that you mentioned earlier about how obviously we're left with fewer and fewer survivors these days, and soon we won't have any. Do you think that your way of counteracting that is to create something written, is to write books, is to write plays, things that can be read, things that can't be destroyed and that will live on? Is that one of your motivations? Maybe naively, I believe that art can be a, like a rocket into the future. Art can, cap, can capture, like a capsule, uh, the emotions. And it could be an emotional carrier. Historians can, can bring into the future the facts, the events. Uh, but art has a different mandate. And I think that. Uh, if we, not me necessarily, there are greater authors than me. There's Jorge Simpon and Primo Levi 
and the Israeli are on Appelfeld, and uh, Imre Kertesh, the Hungarian. These are Holocaust survivors who really wrote about the Holocaust, and I think that their work, works of art will live for a long, long time, and I hope that many, many generations will read it, will address it, will identify, will, em will emotionally be involved by that works. Because a, a work of art can trigger a person's emotions, and then it can trigger a, a person's thoughts, his rationale, but his emotions are very, very important. And the way I react when I read Homer and I reach where Ulysses, I reach the part where Ulysses comes home, nobody recognizes him except his dog. When I read this passage in Homer, I always say to myself, wow, this is a true emotional moment. And if I can feel it, it happened, if it ever happened, it probably happened to someone because Homer picked it up from someone, maybe his own life. But this small moment of a person coming home and being recognized by someone, and he knows that he finally is at home, such an emotional moment that crosses time, Alexandra. I hope that there will be people in the future who will see a movie, uh, who will read a poem, who will read a work of fiction, who will see a work of art, a visual art, a video, I don't know what. There will probably be more, uh, more ways, artistic ways, and they will ex experience the art and their heart will be moved. Nava Samal, thank you so much for talking to us today. Thank you very much.